Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Todd Bishop and I serve as the Wildlife Bureau Chief for the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. You are attending one of 18 local meetings being held across the state this week to recap the recently completed hunting and trapping season and discuss any proposed changes to hunting regulations for next year. We have a few short recorded presentations that provide statewide summaries of wildlife population status and trends, as well as some harvest estimates from last season. In the room with you this evening are local wildlife biologists and conservation officers that manage wildlife habitats, conduct population surveys, and enforce hunting regulations in your area. Together, all of you in this room participate in the annual management of wildlife populations, which is why these local meetings are so valuable. The rest of this meeting is for you to ask questions, provide comments, and participate in a group discussion regarding hunting regulations and wildlife populations. Please share your observations and experiences, both good and bad, from last hunting season. We have at least one staff member taking notes at your meeting to record your comments and summarize the discussion. If you have more specific or lengthy comments that you wish to submit after the meeting, please do so. Comments received via email will be weighted equally to the comments made during the meeting. These meetings coincide with the legislative session, and there's often proposed legis legislation regarding hunting regulations at the time of these meetings. We understand that this might come up during your discussions. We want to be clear that we do not carry those comments forward to lawmakers, and we do want to remind you to work with your legislators directory, directly on any input you have regarding proposed legislation. Also, if you know of anyone who's unable to attend one of these meetings, the recorded presentations will be posted on the website beginning next week. We'll continue to accept comments via email and the appropriate address is included in the recorded presentations. Many of you have regularly attended these meetings over the years, and I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your continued participation. Not just at this meeting, but throughout the year as you work with local staff on wildlife habitat projects, assist in wildlife disease surveillance programs, report your deer and turkey harvest, and participate in wildlife and hunter surveys. For those of you that are attending for the first time or are new to hunting, welcome. Please take this opportunity to introduce yourself to the staff present in the room. Know that we depend on your engagement as hunters and conservationists throughout the year to accomplish our ultimate goals of long-term conservation of the wildlife resource and providing quality hunting opportunities now and for future generations. Again, thank you for your participation and have a great meeting. Good evening, I'm Jim Coffey, forest wildlife biologist for the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. My office is out of the Sheraton Research Station down at Red Hall State Park. And my main duties are to talk to you tonight about our small game squirrel population, wild turkeys, and rough grouse. Squirrels provide a great opportunity for many Iowans on, across the entire landscape. We see an average of about 14 to 18,000 people hunting per year, which is a downward trend overall historically. We still have average about three squirrels per person per year, so opportunity is still very available across the state. We have two species of squirrels that are available to be hunted, the fox squirrel or the gray squirrel, with a daily limit of six and a possession limit of 12. Our season continues to be very long, which provides opportunities all the way from Labor Day to the end of January. Our historical squirrel harvest, as I mentioned, is on the downward decline, but that is mostly because of the decline in hunting hunters on the landscape. Again, lots of opportunity with a daily, uh, or excuse me, an average of the three squirrels per person still being seen in the bag. Wild turkey hunting provides a lot of opportunities in the spring, which is a non-traditional time of the year for most hunters. Uh, 2023 was a record harvest uh, recorded in the state of Iowa. Although we did not have as many hunters as we saw in the 2020 COVID year, we did see a record, record number of birds registered, most likely to our third uh, straight year of increased production across the state. We also have a fall opportunity, not as highly utilized by hunters, but providing a lot of uh, recreational opportunity. About seven to 8,000 people average buying a license for the fall season, and we harvest around five to 700 birds per year across the state. 
We do an, an annual turkey survey in July and August that gives us a good idea of the production. We break that down into the nine agricultural regions of the state. And seven of those nine uh, regions did see an increase above the five-year averages for nest success and for poult production. Rough grouse is another species that I work with. Although limited to Northeast Iowa, we do continue to have some grouse available on the landscape. Um, there are so few grouse hunters in the state that it's difficult for us to understand who is hunting and where and why they're hunting. Um, but there is still some grouse opportunity, especially in the driftless region of the state. Uh, grouse are associated with, with early successional timber, and we know that that is a habitat that is in decline in the state of Iowa. We welcome your comments tonight at this public hearing about the wild turkey, the rough grouse, and the squirrel populations of the state of Iowa and hunting regulations that you may like to see changed. If you have any further questions, feel free to contact us through this website or contact me directly at the Sheraton Research Station. Good evening, everyone. My name is Todd Bogenschutz. I'm the Upland Game Biologist for the Iowa DNR, and I'm gonna give you a quick review of our Upland Game seasons over the past year. So first, I'm gonna go with our population survey information. So you can see in the table there that our counts from 2023, we showed pheasants and Hungarian partridge both uh, increased across the state compared to 2022, while quail and, and rabbits kind of stayed the same. If you look at our distribution maps there on the side, we had our best pheasant densities up in the northwest and north central, but our pheasant numbers actually in northeast and southwest actually showed really good improvements, like some of the best numbers they've seen in 15 or more years. So we were coming into the hunting season with pretty good expectation. So moving on to harvest, we do a harvest survey after the small game seasons are over. Uh, our cottontail season doesn't end till February, so I don't have any numbers for this past year, but what you can see on the table there is our numbers from previous years. And if you look at our 10 year average there, most of our populations and our harvest have been at or above our 10 year average, so that's good. Based on our roadside counts, I expect pheasant and Hungarian partridge numbers to be a little bit better than they were um, a year ago. I expect the other species to be similar. Just a few pictures from our Facebook site, kind of showing the success we had in some of the early parts of the season. We did have comments about the number of non-residents, which is probably not a surprise given our bird numbers. So with that, I'm gonna kind of jump into big picture items with habitat through time. So if you look at our upper graph there, the green line is the amount of habitat we've had in the state since 1990. And so if you look at where we are today, we've lost a strip of habitat that's almost nine miles wide that would stretch from Omaha to Davenport. Now the brown line in that figure is our harvest. So you can see our harvest is kind of matched what's happened with our habitat trend. We don't have the habitat, so we can't grow as many birds. If you look at the bottom graph, we had some bad weather and the loss of habitat there in the late 2000s, but you can see since 2011, we kind of bottomed out with our lowest harvest there at 100,000, but it's been an upward trend since 2011, so that's a good thing. Um, actually, the last two years, Iowa's had the highest pheasant harvest of any state in the nation outside South Dakota. But I think looking at the top graph, you can see that really habitat's the elephant in the room for us. So I wanna jump into the farm bill a little bit. What the table at the top there shows you is that historically, um, CRP has been important to us, but it's actually become more important through time. Now CRP makes up about 62% of our pheasant habitat in the state. So as CRP goes in Iowa, so go pheasants. And so that's why the farm bill is super important to us. Um, some of our priorities in the, in the next coming farm bill are obviously CRP, especially rental rates. We want those rates to stay up. That kind of makes it easier for landowners to get in the program when those rates stay competitive. And secondly, our walk-in program is actually funded through the farm bill. And so there's discussion about increasing that funding. So we view that as a good thing uh, for our hunters. Maybe we can get some more access out there in our walk-in program. And so to wrap up, as I mentioned, you know, we had some trends there with increasing non-residents, a lot of comments about that. So just those numbers in the middle there show you back in 2005, we had about 29,000 non-resident pheasant hunters. Of course, we had the bad weather and we lost all that habitat. And so we felled about 6,000 non-resident hunters in 2013. That number has since increased. So if you look there in 2021, we had about 14,000 plus non-resident hunters. So definitely our non-resident hunter numbers have increased, and so we're aware of that, and made that information available to the Natural Resource Commission. 
And probably the last thing I'd like to wrap up with is actually in 1925, it was our first pheasant season. So that makes 2025 our centennial year or 100 years of pheasant hunting within Iowa. And so look for the department to kind of do a year long campaign kicking off with the 2024 pheasant opener and running through the 2025 pheasant opener just to celebrate our long history as being one of the top pheasant states in the country. So with that, if you have any comments, please send them to the address at the bottom there. And we look forward to any questions. Good evening, my name is Vince Evelsizer, State Fur Bearer Biologist with the Iowa DNR. First thing I'd like to talk with you is about the fur bearer populations um, summary for this past year is that the good news is, is that a lot of our fur bearer populations are stable to increasing. And the only exception to that is the muskrat and gray fox populations are on a downward decline. Annual statewide harvest for the past six years um, as if you look at the columns there, the red circles, there was a few things to point out with you that you might find interesting. First one being there is muskrats on the left-hand side. Last year's harvest was relatively low. When you look at the next circle below that at the, the uh, long-term average of muskrat harvest. So looking over to the right on this table more, um, just wanted to point out the coyote harvest too. Um, not long ago, you know, just in 2020, 2019, the coyote harvest was very high. We set record highs then. And in the past year or two, the reported coyote harvest has been considerably lower, um, mainly due to downward trends in the coyote pelt price market. Um, and this is reported harvest as well, those furs that are making it into the fur market. This basic graph here, I thought you folks might find interesting is, is coyote harvest. And we're lucky we have records going back all the way to 1930 for annual coyote harvest in Iowa. Um, just wanted to point out here that from the 1930s to the mid 1960s, coyote harvest was relatively low in Iowa. And beginning in the 1970s, especially, it started to really go up. And so from the 1970s to the early 2000s, coyote harvest was higher than ever. And then from 2011 to 2020, we set all time records for annual coyote harvest. However, in just the past three years, we've also seen that annual harvest drop way off again, as we mentioned, due to the pelt prices for coyotes. Muskrat, I uh, wanted to talk with you folks about two fur bear related pilot projects, research projects. First one being a muskrat pilot project. Um, main impetus for doing this study is the declining population, not only in Iowa, but throughout the US and Prairie Canada. So this past few months, um, 13 states have been able to get together and found funding um, to do a project together collaboratively. It's a one year project to look at muskrat health, specifically disease and uh, eco environmental contaminants. So, it's just a one year project where we're collecting 30 to 50 rats um, from Iowa and 12 other states are doing that as well. So we're excited about that research project. Second pilot research project is maybe one you've already heard about is a gray fox pilot project. Um, again, for the past 20 some years, the gray fox population has gone down. We're concerned about why that is. We have some ideas of why that may be, but we don't know that for sure. So. This project is hoping to get at that better, increase our understanding of gray foxes. And so we want to put some collars on these gray foxes and track them and figure out specific causes of mortality, habitat use, that kind of thing. And uh, in summary, as far as pending proposed changes to fur bears for this upcoming winter, um, at this time, uh, we will not be able to propose any changes to the fur bear season otters and bobcats included at this time until um, Executive Order 10 um, expires. Thank you for your time. Um, if you have any further questions about fur bears, feel free to reach out to me, Ben Sevelsizer. I'm in the Clear Lake DNR office. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Oren Jones, a waterfowl biologist with the Iowa DNR's Wildlife Bureau. Tonight I have an update for waterfowl hunters. Continental duck populations declined in 2023. Surveys conducted by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Canadian Wildlife Service on the northern prairies indicated that populations were below the long-term average, both for all duck species but, and mallards in particular. Combined with widespread drought during the fall, this resulted in reduced habitat, quality, and quantity available for migratory birds, both in the upper Midwest, particularly east central Iowa, but this expanded throughout the Mississippi Flyway. Combination of lower populations and drought conditions resulted in below average migration through our state this fall. In our fall migration survey, seven of 17 wheats were below the long-term average and the total ducks counted was the second lowest in the last 10 years. So overall, we hunters had fewer places to hunt and we had fewer birds to pursue in the fall of 2023. Looking ahead to 24, in terms of hunting season regulations, it will be very similar to 23, which is a few minor adjustments to dates due to the calendar date changes. So this means we'll have a 16 day teal season, a nine day metropolitan goose season. The regular duck season and the regular goose season will be very similar to 2023 and there will be no daily bag limit changes. Beyond 2024, we're looking ahead through the 2026 to the 2030 waterfowl hunting zones and season structure decision. We've begun this process by examining biological data to evaluate our hunting seasons. We also are conducting a waterfowl hunter survey. In October, the Fish and Wildlife Service will finalize the options that the Iowa DNR will choose from. The Wildlife Bureau will draft a proposal in late October. This will be presented to the Natural Resource Commission in January of 2025, following which there will be a public comment period in February of 2025. So a year from now, the Natural Resource Commission will make a final decision in April of 2025, which will then be submitted to the Fish and Wildlife Service shortly thereafter. Lastly, a reminder to migratory bird hunters to make sure you register with the Harvest Information Program, HIP. HIP is a mandatory requirement for everyone who hunts migratory birds. Here in Iowa, we made a few changes to HIP registration. HIP registration is now conducted after you purchase your hunting license. So first you purchase a hunting license and then a migratory bird fee, and then you go online to get a HIP registration number. The Easiest way to do so is through the Go Outdoors Iowa app there's a big button right on the home screen to HIP register, it takes you to the questionnaire, which generates a registration number that's then found in your digital wallet and you can print that on your paper license. And a reminder for who registers for HIP and who does not. If you hunt migratory game birds, so in Iowa this means ducks, geese, doves, woodcock, rails, snipe, and coot, then you need to have that HIP registration number. If you hunt resident species such as cottontail rabbits, pheasants, deer, or turkeys, then you don't need to register for HIP. That's all I have for waterfowl hunters tonight. If you have any questions, feel, feel free to reach out to me directly. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jace Elliott, state deer biologist with the Iowa DNR. I'll be providing an update on deer harvest, population trends, and disease status over the past year. I'll also be discussing our proposed changes for the upcoming 2024 deer hunting season. Across the state, hunters report just over 104,000 deer harvests this past season. Now this is down 5% from last year and down 2% from the five-year average. While harvest was a bit lower than last year, you can see that we're still holding a very stable statewide deer harvest in Iowa over the last decade. Now you're looking at a map that shows the percent change of this year's harvest compared to the five-year average in that county. In North Central and Eastern Iowa, you can see that relatively more deer were harvested per county than the five-year average. This is likely due to recovering deer populations in the North Central region, 
along with relatively low EHD activity in the east central part of the state. Looking now at western Iowa, you can see that most counties had drastically lower harvest than their five-year average. Now this trend is primarily due to a sustained decline in deer numbers uh, that we've been seeing in the western third of our state. Shortly, you'll hear what changes we are proposing to work towards increasing deer populations in these counties. Finally, in southern Iowa, we also see declines in harvest, though not as severe as western Iowa. It's safe to say that our past EHD outbreak affected deer abundance and harvest opportunities to some degree throughout many of these counties. We'll talk more about EHD in a few slides. Now here is our statewide population model, which shows a slightly increasing trend over the last decade. Now here in Iowa, we're fortunate to have a number of independent data sets that we use to determine deer population trends over time. Included in this figure are deer vehicle collisions, spring spotlight survey, bow hunter observation survey data, and antler deer harvest. Moving on now to our deer disease portion, we continue to see chronic wasting disease increase its geographic range and prevalence with five new counties detecting their first chronic wasting disease positive deer in 2023. These counties are Marshall, Guthrie, Monroe, Howard, and Jones County. And you can learn more about chronic wasting disease in Iowa by visiting our website or attending our annual CWD public virtual meeting that's held every fall. Switching gears now to epizootic hemorrhagic disease or EHD. Now 2023 included the second highest reported mortalities from EHD in Iowa's history. An average EHD outbreak in Iowa leads to roughly 200 reported mortalities statewide and this year we received closer to 2000. 2023 was also our most widespread EHD outbreak spatially with at least 77 counties affected by this disease. Now please keep in mind that this is not a total mortality estimate and this report is only as good as the data that we receive from the public. With that being said, if you or anybody you know encounters deer that may have died from EHD in the future, please provide that information to your local conservation officer or wildlife management staff. Based on what we've learned from prior EHD activity in Iowa, deer populations tend to recover from even the most severe outbreaks within two to three years in counties that have strong deer populations going into the outbreak. This can definitely be said about most of central, uh, south central and southeastern Iowa. Now here are the proposed changes to the upcoming 2024 deer hunting season. As you can see, we're proposing to increase county antlerless tags in five north central counties due to their expanding deer populations in this region. We're also proposing quota decreases in seven western Iowa counties, as well as adding six western Iowa counties to the buck only restriction during the first gun season. These regulatory proposals are in response to a declining uh, deer population uh, that we've detected throughout western Iowa over the last decade. By limiting doe harvest, we're hoping to allow deer herds to recover over time, leading to deer numbers that provide a more quality deer hunting experience for hunters in this area. Deer hunters in western Iowa should keep an eye out for upcoming public meetings to discuss this population decline and learn more about what we can all do to improve this situation. Finally, I wanna add that we recently conducted a 2023 Iowa Deer Hunter Survey, which was distributed to 10% of our resident deer hunters across Iowa. Uh, as you can see, this survey includes a number of diverse topics, including hunter perceptions of fair chase, emerging technologies, and weapons used in each season. The report for the survey can be found on the Iowa DNR Deer Hunting website, I want to thank you all for attending these important meetings as your participation is a critical component of our deer management process. If you have any questions about deer or deer hunting in Iowa, feel free to contact me through my phone or email address. Thank you. Hi, I'm Paul Fraze with the Wildlife Diversity Program and today I'm going to talk to you about the venomous snakes of Iowa. Uh, you might be uh, surprised to know that there are uh, four species of venomous snakes in Iowa. Uh, the timber rattlesnake, uh, the massasauga, which is a small species of rattlesnake, the uh, prairie rattlesnake, and the copperhead. As you can see, all, all of them are either state endangered or a species of greatest conservation need, and one in particular, the massasauga, is actually federally threatened. 
Uh, all those species are afforded some type of protection under Iowa code, um, and the Massasauga, of course, is protected under the uh, Federal Endangered Species Act. So the uh, timber owl snake is the uh, largest species of venomous snake we have in the state. Uh, it's between three and four feet long when it's uh, an adult size. And you can see from the picture, it's uh, got these nice dark chevrons on a light background. Uh, all of our venomous snakes have a heart-shaped head and a narrow uh, neck, which kind of accentuates that head shape. And then they have uh, elliptical or cat eye pupil. Of course, our rattlesnakes have a rattle on the end of their tail, um, and you cannot uh, age a rattlesnake by how many rattles it has. It actually depends on how many times it's uh, shed its skin. And so it eats more, it sheds more, and of course has more rattles. Uh, rattlesnakes can lose their rattles for, for various reasons, and so occasionally I've found rattlesnakes that don't have a rattle on the end of their tail. And you can see from the uh, map there, the, uh, the uh, timber rattlesnake is the most widely distributed uh, venomous snake found in the northeast, southeast uh, part of the state in scattered populations, and then in uh, Madison County out there in the west. Uh, they usually have to have, they have to have uh, rocky or, or uh, cre rocky crevices or outcrops um, to hibernate. They go below the frost line. That's how they survive the winter. Uh, next uh, rattlesnake is the prairie rattlesnake, which is a fairly large rattlesnake found in a very isolated population uh, in Plymouth County in the northwest part of the state. They're much more common as, they, as you go west into the Dakotas. Um, this population is found on private land, which is fortunate because they're interested in conservation. Uh, Massasauga, again, is a small uh, rattlesnake, uh, kind of chunky, and uh, has a nice uh, blotchy pattern with uh, dark uh, spots on a light background. They formerly were found throughout the southern part of the, of the state and the eastern part of the state, restricted to these counties as you see here. They use uh, uh, wet prairies for uh, most of their habitat, which is a very rare uh, habitat. And finally, the copperhead, which is our last venomous snake species, not a rattlesnake. They don't have a rattle, but they do have that heart-shaped head, the elliptical pupil. And you can see from the picture, they're really uh, well camouflaged, uh, especially as you see in the, the dead leaf litter. They, they don't show up very well. Found in the extreme southeast part of the state and scattered small populations, all on private lands. So we don't know much about our copperheads in Iowa. They are more common as you go south and east of Iowa. We're on the edge of their northwest part of their distribution. Um, the, uh, the Department of Natural Resources is trying to manage properties that, ha that harbor some of these rare species, like the Massasauga. We try to, to uh, manage and uh, improve uh, wet prairie habitat, as well as some goat prairies for other species like timber rattlesnakes. We also do some snake fungal disease monitoring, which is a disease that decimates snakes. And we're also interested in, in documenting new populations of certain species of snakes, like these rare ones. Uh, finally, I want to talk about some of the snake species that are more common and, and harmless and are uh, sometimes mistaken for some of our venomous snake species, like this fox snake here. Really common species found almost throughout the whole state. You can see it looks a lot like some of these other venomous snake species we talked about, the pattern, and then the head is a coppery color as they get older, mistaken for copperheads. They also have a habit of vibrating their tail, uh, which makes them seem like a rattlesnake, and so they're often killed uh, mistakenly for that reason. They're harmless. A beneficial uh, snake. And uh, the northern water snakes, another species of snake that's often killed uh, mistakenly. They kind of look like uh, some of our species of venomous snakes. They actually have a, a, a triangular head. They do have the round pupils um, found around lakes and ponds. Uh, oftentimes people mistake them for a water moccasin, which is another name for a cotton mouth, which is a venomous snake not found in Iowa. So most of the water snakes you see are, are this species and they are all harmless. So hopefully you've learned a little bit about snakes and venomous snake species. Um, uh, they're definitely an important part of our natural heritage. Thanks. Hi, my name is Craig Cutts, um, Bureau Chief with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources Law Enforcement Bureau. Just wanted to take in a moment of your time to reflect back on the successful 23-24 season that we just concluded and talk about some of the things that we learned from it. One of our fastest growing sports right now is our nighttime thermal hunting um, that we've seen with our sports people out in the field. Relatively new, um, and this has been popping up in popularity over the past five years a lot, but in the last couple years, ex extremely amount of people taking up the sport. One of our concerns with something like this that's brand new is that everybody is being safe when they're going out there into the field. 
with this being such a, uh, a new sport and a sport that's taking place in complete darkness at night, um, we're wanting to make sure that everybody uh, is very familiar with their scope that they're getting uh, and the firearm that, that, you, that they're using and the limitations because obviously hunting conditions and sight picture is going to be different from a daytime hunt to a nighttime hunt when you're looking through a thermal scope. Some of the things that we have learned and speaking with some of the hunters and looking through some of their optics is that there is a huge variance in the quality of what you see when you look through some of those thermal scopes. Some of them you're going to see a very, very crystal clear image at a long distance. Um, maybe another unit that's not as expensive, your range is going to be cut way down. Um, what we're encouraging hunters is that no matter why you got into the sport, whether it's a YouTube video you watched or a buddy that got into it, is that you learn the capabilities of your thermal scope that you purchase and that you put on your rifle before you go out into the field. Obviously, we want you to be safe. We want you to be able to positively identify your target. And that's one of the key things here is when you're looking through that thermal scope, things are going to look different than they do when you're out hunting during a daylight hunt. It's important that you know 100% what your target is before you pull the trigger. So that being said, take the time before you go out into the field, get familiar with your new scope, learn the limitations of it. Not every scope that you buy are going to be able to go and see and identify images at 500 yards, 300 yards. Some of them that I have looked through, the capabilities would be considerably less. You need to know that and make that choice before you go into the field so that you can make sure that you are going to be a safe and successful hunter when you go into the field. I want to conclude with just thanking everybody for the good um, communication that you have with our officers in the field. And, and our officers pride themselves on being available and being able to communicate with all the sports people in their area. Our numbers are listed in the hunting regulations, the fishing regulations on the website. And I encourage you to continue to reach out to your local officer. If you're traveling to a different part of the state, where you're going to be recreating, take the time to reach out to that officer um, in that area before you get there if you have any questions or you want to know something particular about the area. We love to be able to communicate with our sports people in the field and we encourage them to reach out to us at any time and we greatly enjoy that communication back and forth. We are a team and we need to work together and we enjoy doing that. Thank you very much and have a safe 24-25 season coming up.